Brendan Oud. Um, I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of LearnUpon. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, we're, um, uh, our, maybe it was a bit about us. Uh, myself and Des founded the company in 2012. We previously worked in the LMS space um, for uh, 10 and 12 years respectively. So we were aware of a lot of the frustrations of LMSs in the market and we were keen to, to build a better solution um, to delivering online content and uh, classroom-based content for our customers. Um, we've grown uh, fairly fast in the last seven years. We've over a thousand customers today. Uh, some names you'll recognize there. Um, so we're, we're very proud of that. Um, the the uh, kind of companies that are using LearnUpon um, as their LMS. Um, we've, we've grown the team from myself and Des to over 130 people based, uh, you'll tell from the accent, I'm from Dublin in Ireland, so our headquarters are there. We also have a super team in Philadelphia um, and a team in Belgrade and Sydney as well. So we're a tr truly global business. Um, and uh, just to kind of, the kind of main areas that we're focused on, um, we believe that a lot of the LMS solutions on the market are very clunky, overly complicated. Um, uh, a lot of um, take a long time to implement and very hard to get the ROI that you want from the solution. Um, heavily customized as well. So our, our approach was to build an LMS that was simple and got to the point and addressed the key areas that learning administrators and instructors uh, and learners would want. Um, and that's why our, I guess our partnership with Degreed works really well on the LXP side. Um, they've adopted a very similar approach to the learner experience. Um, we, uh, we focus uh, very much on our customer support. It's been core to our success from the start. Um, as I mentioned, our team is based right around the world, so we have a 24-7 support team, and we have a super customer success team that allows us to partner with our customers to make sure they're up and running successfully um, and getting um, the, the benefits um, that they expect from, from LearnUpon. Um, so just to briefly touch on our partnership with Degreed, um, we've actually been working closely together for about 12 to 18 months now. We have a number of joint customers um, who've uh, uh, using both our platforms together. Um, we're getting lots of great feedback from that and we're constantly evolving and improving um, the two, how the two platforms work together. But they're, they're very tightly integrated. Um, it's kind of a seamless integration from degree through to learn upon um, in terms of uh, learners being able to take their content, etc. cetera. Um, and both teams work very closely together um, as well. So uh, as part of this partnership, uh, uh, customers will be able to sign up for Degreed and learn upon together um, tr through Degreed. Um, but also what we have is uh, a combined customer success and support teams in the background that are experts in both systems and are working very closely together. So Rachel from our customer success team is here today um, and she's been involved in a lot of our joint implementations to date. And we've built out basically learn upon Degreed experts for want of a better word, word uh, in our company and Degreed are doing the same to make sure that when you implement Degreed and learn upon together, you get an amazing experience for both your learners and for your, um, your administrators and uh, for your overall training delivery. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, Chad, but I think that's most of what I wanted to cover. Uh, Cahill is here as well. Um, Cahill heads up our partnership side, so it's also worked closely with Danny on the Degreed side and the Degreed team. Both Rachel and Cahill and myself, if you have any questions or we have some iPads, if you'd like to see a demonstration of Degreed and LearnUpon working together and just see that seamless integration, um, we are ha be happy to show you. We're here today, tomorrow, before we fly back to Dublin on, on Friday. So thanks very much for your time. Welcome to my home state of Texas. I know it's a little misleading, Harvard and in Texas, but I'm based in Dallas and thrilled to be here with you. This is probably splitting hairs, but um, are there any Texans in the room? So in Texas, when you say howdy, only Aggies respond. So, you know, in Longhorn country, I felt like I should point out that technicality. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, my name is Erica A. Bear. I'm with um, Harvard Business School's Corporate Learning Group. And we get asked, um, are you with Harvard Business Review? Are you um, with executive education? Are you recruiting for the school? So it's none of the above. Um, the Corporate Learning Group is an extension of the school. And we are making the Harvard Business School experience accessible and scalable to leaders at all levels. And what makes this really unique in this market 
is that we have a number of channels we can leverage from the Harvard ecosystem. And I'll explain what that means. And this, I like to walk. This is kind of tenuous. But, um, so our goal in building out these channels specifically for the corporate market is to ensure that leaders are learning within the context of their industry, their organization, and in the flow of work. Because we believe very strongly in the science that learning should be integrated with work. And we've been doing this almost 15 years now. Um, before it was cool, but we're really glad that we no longer have to evangelize that concept. So that makes it a little easier. And I'll take you through some of the channels. Um, one is research and thought leadership. So through Harvard Business Publishing, that acts as a bit of a think tank for cutting edge business practices. We also have research centers located around the globe, and that helps fuel our point of view as well. But it also gives us kind of a boots on the ground. So if you think about a research center in Buenos Aires or in um, APAC, that's helping us really understand the local market contextualization and the nuances to those markets. And as globalization becomes more prevalent, it helps us use those as valuable teaching points. Um, another channel is our digital content offerings. So we're translating all that thought leadership into content platforms for the corporate market. And one that we launched recently is called Spark. Um, it's powered by Degreed. We paid them to say that. Uh, but we, we went to market extensively and found that to be best of breed. So it's personalized, dynamic. And when the content is actually through the degree platform, it's quite seamless and um, slick. We'll have breakfast and a lunch table tomorrow if you'd like to come by and see it in action. Um, another channel is our uh, virtual classrooms and our video studios. We have video studios around the world. And those help cohorts of your leaders interact and engage not only with each other, but with our faculty and experts. And they're doing so in a way that mirrors the way global work really happens. Um, we also have a state-of-the-art video studio we've built on the Boston campus. And it's called H HBX. And it's a kinetic experience, as we call it. But if you could picture you're dialing in from your office in Mexico City. And you're going to be with a cohort of 60 people to do a live virtual case discussion. And the faculty's in the studio, and they're looking up, and your image is up on a tile on a huge wall of 60 tiles. This is a really high production way to experience a case discussion vir virtually. And um, the other channel, then, would be faculty and experts. So we have a, quite a deep well there. Um, a lot of times, we're pulling from Harvard Business School faculty, and they tend to be the experts on a lot of the business management topics we cover. However, we can pull from other areas. So when we work with health, healthcare clients, a lot of times we'll bring in Harvard Medical School faculty. Um, so it allows us to uh, map the right expertise to the right topic. And then all of this kind of comes together when we combine our point of view with the client's understanding of their business and their culture and their audience. And when we merge thinking, that's when we get really powerful learning experiences and powerful results. And we also engage in a flexible way. So there are clients that will choose to engage in one channel with us. Some in, choose all channels, and others come and go, depending on the ebbs and flows of their business. Thank you. I'm the last of eight kids. I can cover a room like this without this thing. Um, so my name is Sean Masterman. I'm the Senior Director of North American Enterprise Sales for Udemy for Business. And I, I thought I'd take my few minutes here and just talk about a reminder. So anybody who's here attending Degreed Lens, you're here because you've already invested in a platform or you're about to invest in a platform so that you can drive higher learner engagement, so that you can bring a better experience to drive your business and drive your people. And so the thing that's important for us to remember is that the people that you're serving, ultimately the destination for them in that learning experience is probably a content experience. And we forget that sometimes. And the people that you're serving, they do not leave their consumer expectations at the door when they come into work. They use a device five hours a day. We all use a device five hours a day. So some things to think about. 50, that's how many milliseconds it takes us to form an opinion 
about a website or a piece of content or a product. 88%, 88% of us, when we don't have a good experience, we're not coming back. We'll leave. 38% of us will leave and never come back. So now you, what you've got to think about is, how do I deal with this in the context of serving up a content experience? At Udemy for Business, we grew up in the consumer marketplace. So we grew up having to facilitate a consumer experience. So something that happens for us is we are essentially a data analytics company that's taken data analytics and technology and brought together buyers and sellers of learning. Not very different than what Uber's doing to you today. They're bringing together buyers and sellers of rides, okay? And we serve up that data. We have 10 million people a month who come to Udemy.com to the consumer side of our business. We have billions and billions of data points that we're able to collect on their behavior, on their likes, on their dislikes, on the topics they're searching on. And we expose that out to our universe of experts. And our universe of experts sees the demand and they deliver the supply. And that gives us tremendous velocity. We get two to 3,000 courses a month inside of this consumer marketplace. And then what starts to happen is 40 million people have come in and swiped the credit card and taken a course is that they provide ratings and reviews. Now, three things happen with these ratings and reviews. It's interesting. The first one is your users expect to see this. Just like you were buying a laptop or a pair of high tops or you are going on a trip or going to a restaurant, you use this as a measure of quality and experience. By the way, this doesn't happen often in the e-learning space. They're exposing star ratings and the actual reviews. Second thing that happens is our experts get these reviews. There's a, con a continuous content improvement cycle that happens because they see these reviews, they see the feedback. And the good ones say, wow, you want, I'm hearing a lot of people wanting more coding exercises. I'm gonna put coding exercises in the course. Lecture three actually didn't have enough depth on PHP or Panda. I'm gonna go into a little more depth there. This doesn't happen. This doesn't happen in the e-learning space. The third thing that happens is we use this feedback to curate into our all you can learn Udemy for Business subscription collection. The reason that it doesn't work is because the difference in the traditional content creation process, it is fraught with gaps and lags. It just is. And at Udemy for Business, we don't have that friction. We don't have to worry about studio space and expert availability and budgets. We serve up the demand we, and, we, and the, our experts deliver the supply. Um, one of the other things that's interesting that starts to happen too is just velocity of content to market. So that social review process that I talked about, that process, 81% uh, of our content has been updated in the last two years. In the e-learning space as a whole, it's typically less than 50% and sometimes closer to 30. So not only you have con do you have a process where content can get updated on a regular basis, but you also get content out much more quickly into the hands of your users. As consumers, they're expecting relevance. They're expecting timeliness. They're expecting it to be current. They're expecting when they go out, they're expecting to see the new stuff. Nobody goes out to Amazon expecting to see last year's products. They want the newer stuff. The other thing that happens in this process is that our experts, they own the update of those courses. I can also ask questions of my experts. So I have a secondary and tertiary level of learning support that isn't available anywhere else. So as you're thinking about the learning experience you want to deliver, think about the consumer experience. Consumers are looking for ratings and reviews. They're looking for timeliness in terms of what they're looking for, and for, for to, to build up their skills. And they're also looking for access to experts so that they can ask questions. You would never rent a flat in Seattle without saying, where is it located to the owner of the flat? And so we've built these into our product. And so when you think about those consumer experiences, think about how close you're coming to hitting the mark of their expectations. Thank you. I'm Anya Cologne. I'm the Custom Success Manager at DataCamp. And um, I'm Sam Seif. I'm a Senior Account Executive at DataCamp. Uh, so DataCamp's mission is to democratize data fluency. So we found that we wanted our learners to be able to have the best platform to learn and to teach data science skills so that it would be fluent across millions of users, um, not only within companies, but also across the globe. Um, and we've seen that impact because we've hit over four million learners, um, and our companies that have take, joined DataCamp have seen a com course completion rate at 60% which is a way higher than what we've seen um, in any other traditional online learning or course marketplace. 
Um, so want to just quickly walk through, um, looks like it got a little off, but um, <laughs> want to just quickly walk through the uh, four uh, kind of aspects of data camp and how we uh, use them together to really make an impact at organizations that want to upskill in data fluency. Um, so the first is through our skill assessment. Um, it's actually a brand new uh, product that was just launched. Um, it's called Signal. Um, and it's really where people take uh, essentially an assessment of usually 10 to 12 questions where they'll um, actually have to write in code. So it's not multiple choice. Um, and dependent on their answers that they're getting, um, it will either get harder or easier. So we've really developed um, a great way to assess people's skills and then from there guide them in terms of where they need to go to learn where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are. Um, and then once they've taken a course, also can kind of reevaluate that assessment after. Um, and organizations are using this assessment to also see where they have gaps within the organization so that they can guide learners um, in the right direction from there. Uh, so three different uh, pieces of content that we have on DataCamp. One is our uh, courses. So we have over 300 courses on the platform um, in data science and analytics. Uh, ranging from like machine learning in Python to spreadsheets to um, R, SQL. Uh, we have a ton of content on there um, and everything is learned by doing. So you're actually coding on the platform in a live environment and getting feedback in real time on your code. Um, and then once you've actually taken those courses, um, you have to practice. So we have a companion mobile app where you can do five to 10 minute exercises uh, multiple choice, fill in the blank answers, really just kind of assessing uh, once you've taken a course, your retention rate, um, and just getting that daily practice in um, and kind of solidifying what you actually learned in the course. Um, and then from there, we have our projects. Um, so this is where you'll actually apply what you've learned from the courses and the practice mode um, into a, court, uh, into a uh, project, excuse me. Um, so you're actually working in a Jupyter notebook, you're kind of getting that real time uh, environment, interactive, um, and also testing your, uh, your attention from the courses and the practice. Um, so those are the, the four pieces of content that we have on the platform, so just wanted to quickly walk through uh, how we use those. And then um, in terms of kind of scaling this out to the organization, so um, all of our courses um, are able to be integrated within the grid. Uh, and then you can also uh, leverage our single sign-on uh, that we have as well to kind of uh, scale this out to the entire company. Um, and then uh, through degree, you'll be able to access all those data camp courses as well. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a co-founder and general manager of Intrepid by Vitalsource. Uh, happy to be with you here today. So let's focus on the problem. The, the problem from the learner's perspective that we have in most enterprises um, is that they really want a consumer grade experience. They expect learning to be like consumer technology. Um, on the business and organization side, as David talked about earlier today, we see that the pace of change, the pace of change with technology is outpacing our ability to adapt as humans. And of course, learning is our lever, right? So when you step inside an organization, you see what are they doing to solve this? Um, it, we should feel a lot of empathy, a lot of, a lot of uh, feel, feel their pain to, for, uh, to, for what they're going through. When they're trying to create a learning experience that uh, addresses the, the way that learners want to learn at the pace that the organizations want them to learn, they're stuck with a bunch of old school tools. And a lot of times we feel like that 80s action hero MacGyver trying to stitch all this together. So what we do at Intrepid is we help solve high stakes business challenges through learning experiences that you can create on our platform that are engaging, collaborative, and applied, and that can be driven at scale. When people ask who we compete with, we often say, like the classroom. Like we're trying to take the fidelity, the high fidelity learning experience of the classroom and take that to scale. Our quals, we have 20 years of learning experience. We built and sold uh, a learning outsourcing business to Xerox in 2015. We spun out the learning platform business, grew it by about 700%, and then sold that to Vitalsource, which we're part of today. 
We have uh, deep learning technology innovation chops at, across VitalSource, have about 250 engineers who are working on really uh, at the advent of some exciting technologies and personalization of learning, adaptive learning, um, using AI for, to, to advance learning experiences. And we're really fortunate to have some elite customers and partners, which I'll share in a minute. But when you think about like a collaborative learning experience, to break that down, what does that actually mean? Like what's different? It's not just about delivering content. There's scads of ways to deliver content. But what's different is you can have the power of a cohort-driven experience to drive collaboration. You can apply work through missions, through projects. What we're really trying to do is eliminate that distance between learning and real work. Too often these are separate activities. They need to be the same thing. And then we are, we are social beings. We learn together. We learn best together. We want to provide opportunities for learners to interact, to learn in teams, to learn in, through group projects as they're, as they're solving real work problems. And finally, big believers in micro, micro learning, but micro learning in context. Not micro learning that's disassociated around the web, but micro learning that comes together in the context of a learning journey. And finally, we're really privileged to work with some amazing world-class uh, customers across a range of industries, even associations like ATD that are building all of their, uh, the workplace um, education programs for learning professionals on our platform, and a whole range of partners that essentially OEM the platform to use to build their next generation learning experiences, whether those are consulting firms like Deloitte, uh, sales training firms like Miller Hyman, or top business schools around the world. And in the last uh, four years, we've earned about 60 awards um, across, uh, across a range of different awarding bodies for uh, our work and innovation with customers and partners. Thank you. Uh, interesting to see so many familiar faces out there. Um, I'm John Ambrose, president of uh, GoFluent. Uh, great to be here at the Greed Lens. And I want to start off by asking you all a question. What's Bill Gates' biggest regret? Sean, you didn't say anything about Melinda. Come on, Sean. <laughs> no, seriously, what's Bill Gates' biggest regret? He feels stupid for not learning any languages. Actually, very impressed by Martin Zuckerberg, who taught himself Chinese. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you in the room have had some language training somewhere in your, in your uh, career, your lifetime, have tried to learn a language? Almost everybody in the room. How many of you have mastered it? Yeah, a few. Um, learning language is tough. It's really tough, but uh, it can be done, and it can be done in an accelerated way. Uh, our company, GoFluent, is different than many of the consumer language learning solutions that you might have seen or, or uh, even tried in the past. We're all about using technology and humans to uh, accelerate the acquisition of language skills. So we live in a, in a global economy, but unfortunately it's not a homogenous uh, world. Uh, many companies perceive that English is the language of business and will have an, additional, have an initial assessment to hire workforce uh, employees at a certain proficiency of English, but if they're not using that language every day, they will not have the skills that they need to succeed in, in, uh, in an organization. And it's not just English, it's other business languages as well. Language skills are often missing from the L&D agenda. So L&D organizations will typically look at business skills, IT skills, leadership skills, and, IT, and uh, compliance. Leadership skills needs to be part of the agenda. And with new modern platforms like Degreed, this type of uh, solution can be scaled at enterprise uh, uh, deployments. So if you take an existing, uh, a typical client or a typical company of 80,000 employees in 90 countries, draw a typical bell, cur bell curve, you'll see that uh, at least half of the employees are not native English speakers in a typical company, and, which means that 25% of the population is not being well served in terms of opportunities to improve their language skills. So we do this, as I, as I mentioned, through humans, content, and technology, modern platform to deliver language learning across seven different languages. And we do that through a combination of uh, e-learning portal, practice lessons with other, uh, other students at your level, and one, live one-on-one -on -one coaching, all through technology. The company's been around for 18 years. We're the gold standard internationally. You may not have heard of us in the US. We're new to the US market. 
Um, but if you are working in a global enterprise, trying to develop language skills at scale across the organization, we'd love to talk to you. We're working with a number of companies you may recognize. We win lots of awards. But the most important thing is we've made two million more two million people around the globe more effective in speaking the target languages that they need to be successful. Thank you. Try to fit two people up here. I think we can do it. All right. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Ben Sangri. I am a VP of Custom and Technology Solutions and Intuition. It's Hi. so cool to be up here. Super cool. Um, my name is Lisa Ryan. I am VP of our product and people solutions at Intuition. So it may surprise you to learn that we are actually the second oldest institution represented here at Degree Lens. We acknowledge it's hard to compete with Harvard when it comes to history. But we've been around since 1985, originally supplying financial markets training via floppy disk, which was quite a nice business back in 1985. But as you imagine, we've grown and evolved significantly since then to where we're now plugged in to support over 2 million learners worldwide. And as we've grown and evolved, we really think about our business now as operating in the context of the experience economy and delivering true learning experiences for our clients. We think about uh, companies like Apple that still actually derive the majority of their sales through physical retail channels and the importance that shows of blending the physical, tactile experiences with more abstract notions of brand and consumer psychology. And this is all in the context of a rapidly developing consumer technology market. We love this picture of the Pope's inauguration just a couple years apart, showing a very similar event, uh, but being experienced completely differently. And we think about um, this and sim similar examples all the time when designing our training courses. Um, and we really do continue to see the proliferation of consumer customer technologies in the classroom in our courses. We're, we have the great opportunity to work with a number of pioneering clients um, on some really interesting pilot projects. And so we think we're really continued, uh, we're, very, we're served very well by our by our notion of being very experience-centric and not necessarily content-centric. Thanks, Ben. So now that Ben's filled you in a little bit on our philosophy and really our approach when it comes to clients, what I'm going to tell you about is actually what we do to deliver those experiences to clients. So there are four core pillars to how we run our business at Intuition. We are first and foremost, um, we consider ourselves quite prolific authors of content. Um, it's at the core of everything we do, and we've been writing it for over 30 years, almost 35 years. Um, we're an end-to-end -end company, so everything's within the control of our organization. It makes for a very uh, dynamic and agile system with which to produce both our off-the-shelf solutions that are primarily delivered to financial markets. Many of you may know know-how um, as that kind of cornerstone brand, but also our customized content development where we come in and actually help clients deal with specific challenges to their business. That authorship has led us to become experts in publishing. Surprise, surprise. As Ben mentioned, um, our first library was delivered back in the 80s on floppy disks, and I think we've published in almost every conce conceivable format since then. We continue to focus on innovation and exploring new technologies such as AR, VR, and how they can play into the experiences that we help our clients to create in achieving their goals. Engagement is probably top of mind for almost everybody in this room and at this con conference. We know that it's simply not enough to write the content and make it available. You actually have to grab the learner's attention if you want it to actually be impactful. Um, we've built up years of experience working with clients to do such, uh, to deal with such challenges and are able to take those learned lessons and apply them going forward. Finally, we are integration specialists. Again, content does not live in a vacuum, so we know that um, the key to success is making sure that we can serve up our content to the learners that need it in that moment of need. So we partner with organizations like Degree to ensure that there's a seamless experience once a learner decides that a piece of our content is what is gonna help them achieve their goals. All of this is underpinned by our advisory. Um, we constantly help our clients solve challenges. 
um, and will produce deliverables if needed based on the back of that. But they're, we're really seeing a shift towards um, clients coming to us to actually seek industry standard advice on any one of these uh, huge aspects of rolling out learning experiences to an organization. Going forward, we continue to focus on developing and creating digital content-centric experiences for learners that are focused on, sorry, it's a little slow, people, um, people's needs, the needs of the business, and how we're ultimately going to help them achieve that. Um, driving Terry engagement. Tate. Terry Tate has entered <laughs> the building. <laughs> he has, but I've got one, le one slide left. Uh, so we'll focus on engagement and ultimately back that up with data and results. Uh, in order to achieve the objective of not only the individual learner, the learning and development organization, but ultimately the business and the bottom line, which is what we all need to report back on. So, well done. I'll take my Terry <laughs> Tate tackle. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stefan Pino from Training Orchestra. No need to explain to you that I'm not from Paris, Texas. You know it was my accent. Um, so, Training Orchestra is a, is a scheduling system. So we sit on the back end and we manage instructor-led training. So most of the investment, so 70%, more than 70% of the investment are investment in instructor-led training. So e-learning is very big, you know, 30%, but ILT is still here. And we, at Training Orchestra, we provide a scheduling system, a system which is designed to make the most of your strategic resource, like the trainers, the rooms, all the, oops, all the logistics operation, um, and uh, we uh, provide what we call a training resource management system. So we have more, it's moving by himself, you know, I like it. Um, so we have more than uh, 600 clients globally. Uh, we manage $6 billion of training uh, every year, uh, and um, we are in more than 20 countries, uh, so we can provide a system uh, for global clients, and uh, we disrupt the way uh, we manage uh, instructor-led training. Um, oops, let's continue to move by himself. That's okay. Um, oh, and I can't go back now. Yes. So, you know, so usually the typical situation is that um, client will have one of the best LMS, uh, but they will manage uh, instructor-led training with Excel spreadsheet and Outlook. Um, and uh, we provide a training resource management system which is designed to schedule the session, manage all your resource, be it the trainers, the rooms, assign the resource, nice, um, and uh, optimize the resource uh, utilization. We can also manage cost tracking, um, and, uh, um, and of course, we provide uh, reporting and analysis. You will remember this presentation. I will remember too. <laughs> and uh, that's good. That's good. You know. <laughs> so, okay. And so we provide also reporting and analytics. Um, and um, uh, so, as you can see, we will manage any kind of training resource. So, scheduling of the session, managing the trainers, managing the rooms. We will track the budget because it's a very big investment to manage instructor like training. And we also provide a task management system because it's highly complex to manage trainers, rooms, classes, training events. And also, we have data analytics. And data analytics um, uh, in order to make the most of your data. Um, so in the learning stack, you know, as I said, usually the clients, we go to the client, they have one of the best LMS, uh, and uh, they, they manage everything in Excel, spreadsheet, and Outlook. So they have usually two limitations with their LMS. First, the learner experience. So that's why they choose Degree uh, as a learning engagement platform. And um, uh, it's difficult to manage instructor-led training and make the most of their resource. That's why we sit on the back end. So, you know, as uh, uh, positioning, usually uh, a degree is the front end, the LMS is the middleware, and we at Training Orchestra, we are a back office system designed to manage classroom training, instructor-led training. Just to show you an example, you know, because we just connect the, the, the back office, we connect the training scheduler, just as an example, you see here a session, a classes, and the system will tell you who is the best available trainer and what are the best available resources. Okay, you need to schedule a two-day session uh, in boys um, mid-July, and you need an instructor who has the skills 
to train on a specific subject, plus he must speak Spanish, plus he must be in the area. You don't want to fly someone from New York. You know? So the system will tell you, okay, here is who's available and what are the best available resources. You know? So it could be a permanent full-time instructor or it could be a subject matter expert. With some of our clients, we manage 15,000, 20,000 of subject matter experts. Very difficult to know who has the skill to train on what. Who know if John Ambrose speaks uh, Chinese or French? You know? Maybe he speaks. Uh, and um, so the system would say, okay, John can do it, you know, and he could be available for doing that, and he's in this region. You know? So you can assign him, and you can track all the cost, all the budget. Uh, so that's really a resource assignment system. And you can track your budget. You can have real-time visibility over where you are with your budget because, again, it's 70% of the investment, so it's big. And everybody tried to reduce the cost of instructor-led training. Um, so you see here where you are with your budget, where you will be in a few months, and you know in advance that you will respect the budget that you have for the year. So, so that's really a back-office system which is designed to manage instructor-led training make the most of your resource, make the most of uh, the time of the, the, the team in charge of uh, the, the resource management. Thanks a lot. My name is Tim Dickinson. I am the Director of Strategy at Watershed. I'm gonna do my best to embrace brevity and avoid Terry Tate. Um, so if I just get into some of the problems Watershed helps to try and solve, we help organizations understand whether or not their learning is actually effective. We help them aggregate data from wherever those learning experiences are occurring, and we automate that data aggregation and collection to save time, all in the effort of understanding whether or not the massive invest investment being made in training and learning is having an impact on the business. We do that with three core offerings. The, the most kind of public one or obvious one is our learning analytics platform. That is essentially what we do here. We provide a learning analytics platform that allows L&D professionals and management teams and stakeholders to create reports and dashboards to communicate the effectiveness and engagement with their learning across their organization. We also provide data strategy support to organizations. I'll get into a little bit more of what this might look like in practice on the next slide. Uh, and then implementations, that's par for the course essentially for enterprise software. I just wanted to call it out here because when you're talking about implement, implementing a data and analytics strategy, it's going to be time intensive, resource intensive, and complex, and maybe there's even some skills that need to be supplemented or augmented. So, we really strive to partner with our client organizations to ensure that they're able to successfully implement a data and analytics solution for their learning organizations. This is an example of what it actually looks like when Watershed is implemented for one of our clients. This is an example of the technical infrastructure for Visa's Digital University. Uh, we've already heard some themes th this morning around simplifying the learning ecosystem. And you can see down here at the bottom they have a common entry point for learners, which is their learning experience platform. We try to approach that solution uh, or that problem from the back end instead of the front end. So learners typically don't know Watershed exists. We're just collecting snippets of data from all of their learning experiences wherever they happen to occur. I imagine no one can actually read what's in these little blue boxes, but uh, we're looking at Visa's learning management system, content management servers, uh, survey tools, internal SharePoint, all of the different tools that go into that uh, can be accessed from a single point of entry, can also be accessed standalone. So if they don't go through the learning experience platform, what does that data look like? How is that captured and stored in a common place in a common format? Uh, I mentioned the data strategy piece. So Visa is a good example of a Pathgather client that is going to be migrating to Degreed. We've been collaborating both with the Visa team and the Degreed team on that data strategy for what that's going to look like for them as they migrate. Um, Neville and Petter on the, the data and product teams at Degreed have been great partners, great collaborators, as we've provided um, our best practices in terms of what that data should look like so that it is seamless as they migrate from Pathgather to Degreed and can still continue building on all of the data that they've been collecting for, for two or three years now at Visa. Um, and one last thing to touch on, our niche is learning and development, its effectiveness, and its impact on the organization. 
we recognize that most advanced organizations are also going to have their own internal data warehouse or their own analytics team. So in addition to integrations with all of the learning experiences, we also push to corporate data warehouses where tools like Tableau, Alteryx, et cetera, can be used on top of those data sets. I'm just gonna go through a couple of examples of what this actually looks like in practice, because oftentimes analytics can be a bit of a black box. So in this example, we're just looking at a sales training program for a new product release and how that might be actually tracked, how you can actually use Watershed to tell a story. You noticed on the dashboard there's the ability to embed videos, to use HTML to create images and really customize what you're seeing. But you can also do things like A-B tests now, where if you have a sales training program, some people might, might complete training on one sales method. Group A might look at a different sales method. We can then start to look at their actual revenue generation over time, different metrics that are their KPIs, and how do those change as a result of what experiences and learning experiences those different cohorts have actually participated in. And then finally, just a quick glimpse into how everything is built and configured in Watershed. We have a really simple to use uh, report configuration interface that everything that you see is, is built within. Um, and I have five seconds left, so I'm gonna shut up before I get tackled. <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to find myself or my colleague Bill Conran. We'll be here all week. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm not from this hemisphere, I'm from Australia, and uh, there's a small country town near where I grew up called Texas. So it was pretty confusing as a kid when I'd meet someone from Texas, I was never really sure. Um, so my name's Chris Milligan, I'm the CEO of Adepto, um, and we're a partner of Degreed, we're really happy to be here today. I wanna talk to you a little bit about why we're not a learning company ourselves, but we see a lot of opportunity to work within the space, and that's because Every executive of every business, including all of yours, at the moment is trying to deliver a better service to their customers externally in a faster way, a higher quality way, and customers, whether they're consumer or business customers, are expecting that. But internally, our workforce is also expecting a different experience themselves. They want to work more flexibly, part-time, from home, remotely, whatever that means to people. And unless we understand the skills of our organization, it's really hard to deliver on that promise both to our external and internal customers. And the businesses who aren't delivering that are the ones who are struggling. If we look at any index around the world, the Fortune 500 is a great one. We know that companies are constantly falling off that index because they're not innovating fast enough. And so we want to solve that problem. So what we then look at is the technology stack of most organizations. And we think about the workforce, all of the skills available to our business to, to get work done, to deliver these outcomes. We've categorized them over the last 20 or 30 years. We've got employees, we've got contractors, we've got freelancers, we've got alumni. And for each of those workforce segments, we've got a different type of technology. For our employees, we've got human capital management systems. But for hiring new employees, we use applicant tracking systems. For hiring contractors, we use vendor management systems. And we've spent a lot of money building these and implementing them, and I'm sure you all don't want to do that again. But when we think about how do we actually get work done in the most effective way using the skills of our business, these platforms don't give you a single view. They don't give you that one view of saying, this is what we need to get done, what skills are available to the organization to do that. And so that's what we're building. So we call it a total talent platform which in layman's terms is a network of all the people who have, do, or could work for you, and understanding through our partnership with Degree the skills of those individuals so that we can effectively get them to work. And so in a similar way, the only option is for the individual to own their career, own their journey, and therefore own their data and their profile for their whole career. And what we do is we help businesses to build these private networks of talent really to get work done. And so if we think about what we're working towards for the executives, and we've, we've heard a lot about this already, it's can I actually deliver on my strategy, but then how? If I need to go through a digital transformation, do I have the right skills to be able to do that? If we want to launch this new product, do I have the right skills to do that? But for the day-to-day -day users who then need to execute, whether you're a hiring manager, a recruiter, a resource manager, or somebody in the business that's trying to deliver, 
I just want to go to one platform to understand who could do this piece of work for me. Before I even know if I have budget, if I have a bit of project money, G, money or if I have a, a headcount approval, just show me in one platform where I can go. And so that's what Adepto does. We connect to all the different work platforms to help organizations better manage what they've already got and what's available to them. So we integrate onto the different systems that are in there. And as mentioned, because the pact is, is with the user, the individual has a single profile for their career. What that means is organizations will invite employees, contractors, freelancers, alumni, everybody who can do work to a network. But those individuals can exist in more than one network. So if we have an individual that is doing work for multiple organizations, they just have a single profile for their whole career. But what that allows is a range of different use cases, like talent sharing between organizations who want to collaborate, outplacement, upskilling and reskilling across organizations. If one business doesn't have opportunities or projects for somebody to de develop the right skills, they can partner with another who maybe needs those. Another interesting example of this is in the ecosystem space. So we take uh, the veterans, for example. So in Australia, there's an Australian Veterans Employment Coalition. And what they're doing is using Adepto so that all the veterans will come into a, a central network and then 20 organizations collaborate around that to understand what skills those veterans have to an insurance company that may be different to a mining company. And we help with the translation of that so that they can actually match those people to opportunities. Obviously, where this really hits the road is then thinking about how do we re and upskill in work opportunities. So with the two platforms inter integrated together and leveraging the profile and the skills base within Degreed, we can match development opportunities that come through the organization. So whenever a piece of work needs to get done, we can look at who has part of that skill or wants to develop that skill or is on the pathway to becoming that and offer that to those people before we go and hire somebody from the market or look at a contractor to fill that need. We can think about who might we be able to support on that journey through this opportunity. And so that's really important. A lot of our customers are using that. <laughs> Some quick examples of organizations who are using Adepto for <laughs> The blocker, you got me? <laughs> um, we can talk offline in the Q&A. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> Definitely on the content side, it's just, it's, it's what David said this morning, which is speaking a language of skills. So how do you take how do you take, and, I, and some of the platforms that the folks up here are um, representing, I think it's how do I take somebody who's been exposed to a certain number of hours of some skill or tool, how do I roll that up to give some kind of organizational health view so that ha taking an AWS course might help me plan. Actually, Jim Hemgen, I don't think he's in here, in his session tomorrow, they're doing some of this at Booz Allen Hamilton where he's gotten it down to a, he he's, has like a heat map of cities that he can tell what skills they have so as they start planning for projects they're going to bid on that are in their pipeline, they can look up and say, all these people have been exposed to certain um, tools and concepts and, and content, but he's rolled it up to skills that they've been exposed to. Not that they've completed or that they're necessarily certified, but it's a starting point for whether or not they should bid on certain contracts based on the skills that they have. So I think on the content side as we feed into that is how do we enable that and make that more e make make it easier to reconcile um, so that the input the input is easier to manage in a degree or in you know it's not another platform you should be live your mic should be live should be <laughs> stereo um, yeah so like I think some of the other companies up here were doing um, a lot with AI, and in the language learning space, it's interesting because so much of learning language comes back to relevance, and with AI, we're able to understand a user's needs and goals, even industry segments that they're in, um, roles they have in the organization, 
and tailor the content so that it's, it's relevant to um, those. So instead of like learning a traditional way, like you know, those of you who raised your hand, you know, learn the word for cat, learn the word for dog, learn the word for run. Um, we serve up business oriented content that's relevant to um, the role you have and, and the industry you're in and, and do that um, using AI on the front end. We've introduced it and we're refining that and I think that's really exciting for users. From the watershed point of view, the, the biggest point of focus for us in the next year or so is really focusing on workflows and automation. So if we're collecting data on both learning experiences and outcomes and business metrics, if you have uh, certain benchmarks that might not be being met, what can that trigger within another system or another platform to reinforce a skill or to really do anything that you need to uh, launch a new experience automatically so that it's a, a tighter integration across different platforms based on a, a wide variety of data sets. From my perspective, uh, with our focus on collaborative learning, that actually comes with attacks sometimes because you have to manage cohorts, you have to drive communications and all those aspects. So we're investing in, in AI to automate as many tasks as possible, including giving feedback to learners, uh, nudging them when they're behind on something. Um, giving, um, uh, driving insights from, from data through natural language processing. So investing in those things to get the, high, the quality of that collaborative learning experience. So you're not just pushing content, but, but reducing the load on, on administration and authors um, and, uh, and those who are responsible for executing the programs. From a learner home perspective, we're, we're also doing a lot on the AI, ML side of things, but Probably the other focus for us, just to, I suppose not to repeat that the same area, is just around our integration suite. Um, we, we, at the moment, we obviously have a tight integration with Degree. We also have one with Salesforce um, and with another, lots of other tools like Zoom that uh, businesses are using. And uh, over the next 12 to 18 months, we want to build that out with common um, uh, tools that our customers are using. So, uh, for example, in the talent management side of things, um, integrating with the likes of maybe ATP or Workday. Um, we've a, we've a bunch of others there. Uh, on the we've a lot of our customers using LearnUpon to train their support teams. So an obvious integration there is with Zendesk, for example, who happen to be a LearnUpon customer as well. So we're we're work we're, our product teams are working with our customers to identify uh, the highest value integration points that they'd like to see. We, we've a we've a very strong two-way API and single sign-on at the moment, which works well. But we actually want to just productize those integrations to make it even easier for um, our customers to plug learn upon into their current tech stack and uh, to be able to share data across those systems. Great. And, and to your same perspective, am I on? Can you hear me? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, you know, similar to the other content providers, data and analytics are huge for us. Um, we've been able to experiment a lot in the custom content um, division that we run. And now our focus is on bringing that into our product suite, so making sure that we're um, issuing, you know, engaging formats, making sure that people can take content in the way that suits them best. I think one of the great things about Degree is that it shows, you know, what people's preferences are as it relates to how they actually consume the content. So that's really challenging us to, you know, release podcasts, bring in blogs, drive engagement, and then ultimately push into the technologies of the future and how we can bring them into a product suite and not just a kind of niche custom um, solution that's being provided today. And from the data camp side, we're really focused on um, uh, integrating more, obviously, with the trees. Um, what we found with a lot of our enterprises uh, clients is that they're looking to make sure that the simplest way to get their employees in and learning. Um, and then also just building our content. We've, you know, uh, our library, we have a robust course of Sam engines. We have over 300, but we want to build that more and, um, and make sure that we really are, we live up to our mission and that we really are data fluent. And then from Harvard's perspective, we have an incubator that we've stood up where we're actively experimenting with clients and um, trying to make sure that we have all the elements of an ecosystem that should be in a, um, for example, a high potential program or a transformation cascade using badging, um, also things like sensors to detect engagement when um, a learner's actively in a program. So the rest I'm not allowed to share yet. For, for us at Training Orchestra, as we're a scheduling system, 
uh, and that our mission is to optimize the way you use the resource, like the trainers and the rooms. We try to, uh, to ease the collaboration with the instructor. So it could be the internal instructor, subject matter experts, and you can have 1,000, 10,000, 15,000 of instructor who have the skill to train on what. So we are building the Tinder of training, so matchmaking system mm -hmm. to, thank you. Uh, the, the, mm -hmm. you. You know what it is? Yeah, yeah. And, and so. Uh, he does. <laughs> He's married. He's married. And so, the, so the Tinder of training, so the, this matchmaking system to ease uh, the collaboration with the instructor. You know, maybe you're available mid-June, but I have to give you a call and to send you an email and back and forth discussion. All that is a lot of manual operation. If we want to upskill very fast uh, the, 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 the learner, you know, we need to interact in real time with the instructor. So we invest a lot in this instructor portal. really focusing on helping you understand the skills the business needs. So based on everything the business is trying to do, what skills do you need so you can get access to them internally, externally, more quickly and effectively. What are the questions? I feel done a few moment. I guess I'm old. Hi, Dana Sednick uh, from Intuit. Uh, it's clear you're all working on interoperability and kind of integration to build an ecosystem for learners. And I'm curious about um, whether you're thinking or how you're thinking from a learner perspective about um, portability. So the certifications that I take, the badges that I get, the completions that I do, um, both within and across all of your platforms, um, how as a learner am I going to be able to um, take it when I leave into it and go somewhere else, for example. Um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing or thinking about there. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we actually have discussed this theoretically. We haven't seen it happen in practice. Um, we have had a couple of clients who have started to pilot using a combination of two open standards, one being the Open Badges framework, the other being XAPI, to have that open framework for I've completed a set of objectives and I was awarded this particular badge identifying this thing that I did and that now can be carried with me. Um, We've, we've had some clients implement that, although actually I'd say we have one client that has implemented that. Um, and I don't know to the extent that it's actually being used outside of their organization. I know it's used heavily internally, um, but in terms of that external usage, it's, it's something that we haven't seen a lot of yet. I would say this is a trend we're seeing, and um, I have a client that talks about the transference of skills and wanting to, thinking about their employees as current and future consumers. So how do I develop them? And if they leave, maybe they'll come back. And some of the you know, big consulting firms have been good about that alumni type uh, mindset. Um, but this is a technology company in particular, and, um, and so they're actively encouraging people to develop themselves, knowing that they may go elsewhere, but they'll be a lifelong consumer, hopefully, and, um, and influence their their families and children. And, and so we're doing that with badging, and, and it is ex externally facing in some of our cohort programs. In particular, in our frontline leader programs, it's very popular. Yeah, Dan, Great I question, th though. I, I think for us on the content side, it's, it's about, you know, APIs on the content side have been about discoverability and reporting progress. And so it's going deeper so that the APIs that we have would enable the portability, regardless of the platform, just to make sure that we, we branch out farther. Um, you know, Danica and our team is out talking to kind of some non sort of some platforms that you wouldn't expect maybe that we're talking to about areas where we can inject learning, but that we could enable the portability of the skills that were developed to travel with the individual when they leave the organization. But I think, I think for us, it's, it's about making sure that we expose those APIs so that the, the portability could be managed by whatever system um, it, it is a system of record. Yeah, we're, we're also um, talking probably with the same large customer about open badging. Um, and that seems to be the place that people are at least talking to the issue. 
Um, the nice thing about language skills is that beyond the credential, you can demonstrate it when you go in for the job interview that you've, you've mastered proficiency in a new language. It really depends on the customer and the business challenge, what their philosophy is. But we've seen, a, for, for example, a great practice with Microsoft. Um, they created a cloud mini MBA program working with a range of business schools. And they use digital badging to show up in your LinkedIn profile when you'd created program or when you'd, when you'd pass those, those programs. Um, and they had a philosophy of it that it wasn't just about uh, mastering the immediate business challenge, but it was really a, a much higher value proposition of being a talent recruitment engine as well. Like Microsoft, we want to be the place you go to become a cloud seller. Um, so it's, they, they've had a lot of success with that. The fact that we're seeing a lot of, um, but a lot, not, I wouldn't say a lot, but a reasonable amount of requests for integration with um, some badging platforms like Badgeville and things like that. So we've extended our API to make that available and we actually um, adopted a webhooks platform as well that allows us to push those completions and badgings. We've uh, we've our own gamification to learn upon as well, so that can get pushed through to different badging tools, and also even integration with LinkedIn. So, um, similar as mentioned, basically that that can pa the, those certification programs or uh, credentials that you have can get passed through to your LinkedIn profile. Um, I think it's also interesting on the, I guess the business side in terms of the types of learning people do and whether you actually want all that to be portable or not. Some of the, the training that people take in house is it's, it's your IP, it's very bespoke and confidential to your business, your approach to, for example, we work with uh, some customers in the fast food area and they are down to the recipes of how they produce their food, which is obviously highly confidential. So we're, we're definitely thinking about that. It hasn't, we haven't any live use cases of, of it coming up, but we can see it there and you know, there's probably a requirement on uh, us as the LMS vendor to think about uh, when you create courses, can you make it that it's something maybe more soft, generic kind of skill that it, it's great for you to bring that with you through the rest of your career versus something that's more um, internal IP, very specific to our business that, you know, sorry, if you leave our company, uh, we don't want you uh, bringing this with you. So there's, there's some interesting challenges there. User. So individuals who had come to Data Camp to upskill to get into data science, um, and then you know there was a demand within the company that they were in to bring data, you know Data Camp in, and then have taken it with them when they've left that company. Um, so our aspect has kind of been kind of getting the kind of groundswell of users to get into to companies and how they can get that. Um, you know what are the qualifications and, and points that they've gained within Data Camp? How they can you know continue on with them, get promotions, or move on to another. So that's, it's a different approach for us because we were coming from the learner side and trying to get within businesses how they can you know, get the qualifications so that a learner can say, I've taken this course, I, I'm be qualified for this job. Any other questions? So um, I'll ask the last one, just maybe in, in just, uh, 10 or 15 seconds, and don't everyone feel like they have to. But we talked a lot earlier about the vision that Degreed has, and it's so dependent on user engagement. You guys, almost to a vendor, I think, talked about consumer experience. Is there a trend or a preference that consumer um, behavior is evolving that you guys are thinking about, concerned with, or taking into account to make sure that you keep the consumer experience there and can increase user engagement? I'll uh, probably answer this in a slightly different way. One thing that we are extremely aware of as it pertains to consumer experiences right now as a data and analytics company is privacy concerns. As a company that aggregates activity of what people are doing across a variety of platforms, um, it's of utmost importance, but, and you see that from consumers as well. You know, I, my activity is tracked across Facebook to Instagram to Twitter to whatever I'm doing on my phone in the browser, um, and the security of that information, the privacy of that information is of extreme importance to individuals, and the same thing applies when we're doing that internal within organizations. Chad, I think uh, David's um, 
metro map, I think is where we're, how we're looking at this, which is the consumer mentality is just help me get there faster. Help me take only what I need to take. Um, and so a lot, I heard some assessment tools in some of the, some of the panel here, but I think that's, I think that's a, something we've got to unwind a little bit is how do we, how do we make it, how do we make the assessment accurate and then also make it relevant to what's going on at Intuit, so contextually accurate too. Because uh, a certified cloud associate who gets their AWS CA might have to do more work at Intuit. And so how do we make that roadmap relevant to the organization too? And that context matters. So get me there faster, but I still have to be able to do the job in context. I think that's, that's a challenge that we're trying to unwind a little bit. Our focus and what we're being requested a lot from clients at this stage is helping them drive engagement. But I think one of the things that we really take to heart is that you need to be very deliberate in measuring that engagement and know what your outcome is gonna be. Clicks are not enough. Clicks are, I thought this was shiny and great. It doesn't actually show behavioral change. It doesn't show anything. So when we're working with our clients on that, we're sharing metrics, of course, on what content is the most popular, who's engaging and when, and all of that great stuff, but we're also reminding them that there is this other side to that coin of, you know, A, assessing proficiency, um, assessing ability to apply, and then ultimately assessing behavioral change and transformation within the organization. So, um, you know, engagement is a really powerful thing, but I think it needs to be, you need to be very mindful and deliberate in what you're doing so we don't just end up in kind of a, a clickbait learning environment. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> with language learning, I, I, and compared to other forms of learning, I mean, one size does not fit all. I mean, so everything we do is very hyper-personalized to the individual, um, and um, you know, our whole mantra is about accelerating language learning, not teaching language learning, but it's accelerating the process by not burdening you with things you already know, concepts you already know, or vocabulary, or grammar you already know, but really focusing on those areas that you're weakest. And, just one use case, um, you know, the way we, we partner with one company that has call center employees whose English skills are actually very good, but their accents um, sometimes prevent them from communicating well. So we have, you know, that focus is really on accent reduction as opposed to teaching language, but it's, but some of the same skills transfer there. But there we would actually take vocabulary that typical call center employees will use in an engagement on the phone We'll work with those uh, workers with those words, fine tune, refine the way they pronounce them, and so forth. So it's, but it's very personalized to the to the um, experience. Awesome. Anyone else? Any, any last thoughts? Okay. Any last questions? All right. A uh, couple of quick uh, comments before we break. Once again, I want to thank you all for being here. I mean, oh, the effort it takes to get down and spend a couple of days with us. Customers, prospects alike, sincerely appreciate the, the uh, willingness to be here and, and we hope we get a lot out of the next few days. I wanna thank, uh, again, our partner and sponsors. We're, as I said in my kickoff, what we wanna do for your organization is drive value. We cannot accomplish it without a tremendous ecosystem. And, and this group of, of partners are just uh, incredible driving a lot of value, so thank you.